This is our one hour panel discussion on work in a digital and artificial future. My name is Kermit Jones. I'm going to moderate this discussion with our distinguished panelists, Vicky Virasinghe, Roy Bahat, and James Hudson, all of whom's bios I'm going to share uh, shortly. But I'd just like to start with um, just talking about the context of this uh, panel discussion. Over the past two election cycles, in some shape or form, there's been more emphasis placed on the future of work and given the increased competition at home and abroad, with some of that competition being from different labor sectors and some of it being from technology. The increasing presence of artificial intelligence, the concept of computers using tools such as machine learning, deep learning, and neural networks to understand data and analyze it in different ways uh, has increasingly uh, become part of the workforce in everyday society. The global pandemic has highlighted the opportunities and challenges of switching large swaths of our workforce to digital and remote work. For the next 40 minutes, I'll pose questions to our panelists to discuss and debate. And then for the last 20 minutes, we'll open the floor to Q&A from the audience. So just to give a little background on our distinguished panelists, Victoria Virasinghe led the Future of Work team at Palantir Technologies. The team, called Innovation and Jobs, was built around the idea of using technology tools to empower workers in both blue collar and white collar jobs. After founding the team in the US, she spent two years in Germany, expanding the team's reach into Europe. Prior to Palantir, she spent two years at Ashoka Changemakers and in the office of Senator Dianne Feinstein. She currently works in Arlington, Virginia, where she was born and raised, building public-private partnerships around equitable economic development. She graduated from Stanford with a BA in International Relations and an MA in Latin American Studies. Our second panelist is Mr. Roy Bahat. Mr. Bahat is the head of Bloomberg Beta, an early stage venture firm backed by Bloomberg LP that invests in startups making work better with a focus on machine intelligence. Bloomberg Beta has an unusual model for a corporate backed venture fund. It invests for financial return and strives to work in the same new way as startups, transparent, it has, its fully op it has its full operating manual, open sourced and driven by data, and it's highly dependent on trust. Roy was commissioner on the California Governor's Future of Work Commission, following work he did with a think tank in New America to understand the 10 to 20 year future of work and automation in America. He was named one of Fast Company's most creative people in business, has served in government, and led a nonprofit in addition to his work at established corporations and day zero startups. He also serves on the faculty of UC Berkeley where he teaches about media at the Haas School of Business. Mr. Boss also serves, or Bahat rather, also serves on the board of an advisor to several nonprofits, including Stanford Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society and the Economic Security Project. He graduated from Harvard College where he ran the student public service nonprofit. He was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University. And last but certainly not least is Mr. James Hudson. Mr. Hudson is CEO of AI for Good Foundation, a public charity that leverages artificial intelligence to accelerate progress on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. He's also an angel investor in AI-powered startups, acting as chief scientist and scientific advisor to a range of high growth companies around the world. He's a senior researcher at the Zoe Jeff Stefan Institute Artificial Intelligence Research Laboratory and Slovenia. James's research interests lie at the intersection of machine learning, complex science and economics, with a focus on the dynamics of firms, labor markets, and technology-driven change. James has received the Marie Curie Doctoral Fellowship for work that bridges machine learning with econometric math methods for graphic, uh, graphical interference, or inference, and holds degrees in philosophy, computer science, and intercultural communication from Princeton University. Thank you all for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Okay. So now that I figure out, I got through your introductions with uh, hopefully minimal uh, mistakes, I'd like to pose by starting with this question. So there's a lot of different talk about what uh, AI can do for the future of work, but how do we ensure that shared and equitable dividends and a potential future of work that is heavily dependent upon highly skilled labor and AI. When we look at the way that AI and skilled labor um, is currently used and where it may be used in the future.
Where would you like to start with that one, Kermit? It seems like a big question. <laughs> well, it's a, I figure it's a big one to kind of get things started. Um, I think given that you are with this firm, AI for Good Foundation, I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts on that. Sure, I guess, you know, just to you know, peel back the layers of that question for a moment. So it's certainly true, right? That as of right now in the US, more so than in most other countries, and certainly it's the largest country that has this property, the difference between what would be colloquially known or even in the research known as high-skilled workers and low-skilled workers is very large, right? Having a bachelor's degree in the US affords you an enormous um, compensation uh, margin over people who don't have a bachelor's degree in the US. I believe the difference is around 40% in average salaries. Whereas in Europe, it's less than half that. So I would, I would argue that we're already in a state of the world in the United States where we do need to think about what that reduction in inequities would mean when we're thinking about work conditions, especially post pandemic, right? Especially when we've just provided a shock to the economic system, which has affected lower skilled or workers that cannot work remotely more so than workers who are high skilled and can work remotely. Um, and I'm sure each, each of the other, my, my colleagues on this panel will have their own ideas about what the key components are of such a recovery or such a realignment of our economic fabric. I think a lot of it comes down to the core principles that we want, right, from, from our economic engine. The US is built on entrepreneurial activity, right, on taking new ideas to market, on being risk-taking and, and innovative. And I, I think in some sense, we need to rekindle a lot of that and have a lot more innovation from kind of idea stage all the way through to, to production. Also, you know, I, I think one of the large themes in this panel is going to be education. And it's clear that we don't do a very great job right now in providing the incentives to teachers, to schools, and to the education system, especially primary and secondary in the US to really give us the best, um, the best skilled individuals for the workforce that we want to build and that will inevitably develop. Um, I think a lot of these questions are less potentially about technology than they are about making choices about the kind of economy that we want to, to be in and how we get to that. Obviously, technology is going to have an impact. And AI is already having an impact, although we're not necessarily seeing productivity increases or the employment shocks that people were afraid of yet. Um, but I think step one is really to decide what do we want that economic landscape to look like long term. Roy, you're in the kind of startup innovation space. Um, and I'm sure you know everyone that's a panelist on this call uh, is, but what do you see uh, when you look at startups at day zero, or you look at um, investors that come to you asking for investment that we need to change, if anything, in our educational system to make people kind of think with more of an innovative uh, mindset? You know, I've been, I've had discussions with other people or AI experts that said, you know, our educational system was designed to put people into jobs as opposed to put people into a thinking mindset. Uh, do you agree with that? Do you think we need to change things to make people more innovative in, in terms of the future of work? I agree with part of it. Um, I think it's definitely true that our education system, our education system co-evolved with, with the industrial revolution broadly. So it is designed to produce factory workers. And it has produced information industry factory workers um, with some success. And what I don't agree is that what it needs, of course, everybody should be a thinking person. But I think that one of the problems that can happen in the future of work discussion is um, we tend to focus on what I call the future of working for us. And what I mean by that is jobs that people like the folks who are you know, uh, part of the Truman community do, jobs that like those of us on this panel do. And more jobs in the world look different than working at Palantir, for example, than working at Palantir does. And there are essential insights and services, of course, that those companies 
um, can offer, but they're just not representative. They're, they're available um, to a, a relatively small number of people. So the question that I find myself thinking about is, what's our guess on an occupation that millions of people can do now or in the future, pick whichever one you like, because I think the future of work is already here, that you can feed a family by doing? And the answer is probably not software engineering, because there are just not enough jobs doing that. And so the things that people in the education movement tend to talk about, and I think we need government solutions and you know, raising the floor, we could talk about all that stuff. But just to answer your question about education, they tend to thought, talk about working for us type skills. Well, we need more creativity and more empathy and more thinking skills. And those are great for CEOs or for people who work in information industries. But I, I like my, the school that inspires me is the country's first public high school for entrepreneurship is the Patino School in Fresno, California. And the Patino School is not a charter, it's just a normal Fresno USD school. And they teach things like setting your own priorities, how to convince someone of something and sell them something, you know, how to learn which tools you need to accomplish a task. And so those skills of personal reinvention, priority setting, um, like that's the vocational knowledge of the future to me, much more than the working for us type skills, as much as I want everybody to be a thinker and be creative and be empathetic. I think, you know, there's a paper that the Economic Policy Institute came out with, and it shows that the average American worker grew 72% more productive between 1973 and 2014. However, the median workers pay rose about 9% in yeah. that time. And I think this really begs the question of as productivity increases, as we have enormous strides in technology and innovation, who is on the receiving end of the gains of that economy? And I think that there's opportunity here for us to continue being innovative, for us to lead the charge worldwide in coming up with innovative solutions to problems that we're facing. I think the question then becomes, how do we ensure that more people are participating in the gains of the economy? Especially when you have the world of work, like the employment side of it really changing with things like gig workers. So all of a sudden you don't have this traditional contract where you're an employer, an employee of an employer, but you are a contractor. And so this, this type of employment model I see changes with the future of work. And with that are some advantages in terms of flexibility and autonomy, but also I think some challenges in terms of healthcare and pension. And so when we think about, I think, you know, your question, Kermit, that you posed us to begin with, I think we really have to start thinking about how do we ensure that we're bringing in more people to participate in the gains of, our, of the digital economy so that we're really creating equitable distribution of resources that ultimately, you know, feeds back into the ecosystem. You know, that makes me think of the question, because kind of to speak to your point, Vicki, I've had this debate with different people in terms of the percentage wage gains that people have had over that 40 year period, whether that was compensated for for uh, health insurance and pensions. But then kind of to your point, it seems like uh, pensions have gone you know, the way of the dinosaurs. We don't have those as much anymore. Um, how does and I'm posing this question to, I guess, anyone, and I'll end up picking someone if I have to, but how do you think um, workers in this future of work is here now type of economy can uh, negotiate or bargain for these types of increased gains? Um, because it also feels as if unions aren't as relevant as they used to be, right? I'd seen some study that said, you know, maybe nine or 10% of workers now are part of unions. So What's the, the future of bargaining for these types of gains? Well, I think that, you know, there are some interesting 
creative, innovative solutions on the side of labor. Uh, David Rolfe up in uh, Seattle uh, did a very, Roy knows about it too, I mean, I think did a very interesting thing. And I think that model of thinking about, you know, what are, what are new ways to ensure that workers have the right sort of protections? I think something else that Europe um, is a little bit more ahead of us is thinking about data protection and digital health. So, you know, I know that we did a lot of work through the Industrial Revolution to think about physical safety in our workplace environments. I think now we need to start thinking about what does digital health and safety look like? You know, what does it mean to have data protection? What, what are the uh, structures around that that ensure that a worker can do the work that they're doing and not be, you know, unjustly, uh, looked at based on performance or numbers that don't really um, determine, you know, the, the productivity there. So I think that there is a space here. Um, and I know that uh, unions and the labor movement is actively looking at this. And I think it's going to require a little bit more of unconventional thinking in the future work. I kind of feel like that's the name of the game. And a lot of this stuff is the things that have worked in the past are not necessarily the things that are going to work for this new world of work and employment that we, as Rory said, that we are now in and are going to continue growing in. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think that um, it's hard to see an answer without workers organizing um, in many different circumstances. And I watched closely the Amazon vote in Bessemer, Alabama, and, um, and many of these other efforts. And at the same time, Current unions are among the most sclerotic, you know, antiquated institutions around. Why? I think one of the reasons is because unions are one of the most heavily regulated forms of organization in the United States. So it is very hard, legally speaking, to just be a union. I mean, we invested in a company called Unit that just as one example, and I'm talking my book here, but just as an example, um, if you want to unionize in your workplace, they will abstract away all of the national labor relations, you know, vote cards and legal steps and just make it easier for you to do. There is almost no such thing as a startup union. There are some startup labor organizations that do different things, but if it ends up being a world where we have the old view of management versus labor, it's not gonna work. And I mean, I did just give you one other example, which is if you have even a single employee working for you, I believe under current US law, you are forbidden from joining a labor union. Wow, which so seems Roy, crazy. Uh, Roy, just to follow up on that, are you are you saying that in some instances, state and federal governments kind of stand in the way of being able to innovate in this space? No question. Of, okay, yeah, and, I mean, and if law, so, I mean, when I say state and federal governments, I mean law. And I mean, I look at the Clean Slate Project at Harvard Law School, which was an attempt to reimagine U.S. labor law. We're going to need more effective ways of doing it because you know this is relevant, I think, to the Truman community if the effect of workers taking a greater share, um, which you know Victoria talked about the decoupling between productivity gains and wages. The other chart that alarms me is if you look at, I think it, the chart went from like 19, late 60s to 2015, US versus France, the uh, real wealth of the bottom 50%, not talking about the poorest people, the bottom 50% in the US steadily declines and France like almost doubles. France, it's better to be in the bottom half in France than in the United States. I mean, that's just crazy to me that we should be okay with that as a nation. And so I do think that we need a reimagined um, US labor law, but we also need unions where when uh, unions or labor organizations that when they show up in a corporate context, end up making the companies in which they operate more successful. We need a trade craft on things like how do you rapidly introduce automation? Um, because you know one of the constraints is gonna be this push-pull between technology that automates work, it does automate away work, and workers who are harmed by it. We need some government okay. solutions to protect people when they're in transition, but we also need corporate solutions where we have a trade craft for rapid introduction of new technology. Otherwise, guys, we're just going to be like, we'll be having this conversation and China will be, you know, eating caviar out of a spoon while we're busy talking about it and unable to shop at Walmart. And that's not a world that I want to live in. Definitely... Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely have to keep the 
Walmart shopping as much as we can. Um, James, listen, I, I did want to ask, I, I did want to throw a question at you here in this whole idea of, in 2016, um, and even uh, more recently than that, globalization was seen as something that we got wrong uh, in the 90s and 2000s. When there was this discussion of getting that done better in globalization 2.0, which does feed into the future of work and supply chains. People talked about us having all of our PPE supply chains coming through China and that causing so many problems with COVID. Um, do you subscribe to that thought process that we got globalization wrong the first time and we need to do it better? And if you do, how would be what would be a better approach to that when we're looking at, at future of work uh, type of discussions? Okay, well, let me let me step back for a moment. So I, I, I did want to, and I think the two conversations are kind of linked, but I did want to just um, introduce the fact that since 2004, just so that can, I, I know can, these, a lot of these are nomenclature type questions, but since 2004 in the US, total factor productivity of firms, right? The growth in productivity of firms from year to year has declined sharply, right? And this is known as the productivity puzzle over the last 20 years or so, right? Why is it that we've adopted so much technology and yet our firms are growing much less than they used to grow? in terms of productivity gains. So at the individual level, there's kind of this uh, tension, if you will, right? You can, there are some ways to measure productivity gains at the individual level where you see a growth, and there are basically ways where you measure it, and there's zero growth accounting for certain controls that you would put into those. So it's, it's, it's actually a complicated landscape. Um, I would also say that, you know, living in France is not so bad, Roy, right? I mean, we can all hate the French and everything. But on the question of globalization, right, and the reason these things all, all come together. Now, we do a lot of work with countries. We do a lot of work on AI policies, and that really interfaces a lot with future of work because of the uh, skilling aspect of AI policy. That's really the main driver behind a lot of this work that's happening on the regulatory level now. Um, and yeah, people are talking about what happens with globalization? What do the trade mechanisms need to be in order to support a healthy ecosystem of goods crossing borders, human capital crossing borders, and well, governments being able to work together to actually build the things that they have a comparative advantage in, in building, right? And if you look at the knowledge economy, we are doing that, right? On the knowledge economy side, people can work almost anywhere in the world right? And uh, that can include China to some extent and collaborate with people anywhere else. When you look at the goods side of the world, so physical goods, export, import, right? Raw materials, agricultural products, um, and all the derivatives that, that come with that, we run into issues. And we run into issues because of having these very complex supply chain relationships, because of the geopolitical risks associated with moving goods around the world, and because, frankly, countries like to play games with each other, right? And uh, this has always been the case. It was the case before we had globalization 1.0, right? And I think that aspect of global supply chains and risk management of the relationships between countries and between firms will continue to be an issue. It's not something that you can necessarily get right. What you can do is risk adjusted as a country, you can make better decisions about where you place your resources and how you build resilient supply chains. So it would be wrong in any case, even if you were the only the fifth best at growing soybeans, if your economy relies on soybeans, it would be really stupid to stop growing soybeans in some capacity. Right. Even if there are loads of other countries that grow them better, faster, cheaper, and can ship them to you. Right. So globalization, yes, but we do have to think about risk adjusted, the whole infrastructure and how it plays together. Um, technology can help to make things more scalable, more efficient. Uh, but a lot of this does come down to the relationship management side, um, which also also plays into the education thing that, that Roy was talking about, right? So turn, turning our education system into actually building useful human beings from a human perspective that can actually build those societal constructs that we need going forward. 
I, uh, I spent some time, you know, 2016, uh, 2017, 18, traveling across the U.S. and going to places like Detroit and Cleveland and Minneapolis, spending time on the factory floor. And it was really, you know, you would, in those communities, I think what you saw was really um, economies that were depressed. And a lot of, I think the impact of globalization on specifically on those communities and the workers in those communities who really, I think, felt left behind. And I remember coming back uh, to California and being, you know, surrounded by, you know, uh, individuals and institutions that were claiming, you know, the economy was going so well, the stock market was booming. And I couldn't help but wonder, you know, but for who? And I think that, you know, as we, as we think towards um, the future of work and the growth of technology in the US and thinking back to the impact of globalization on communities in the US who were really not brought along, I think it's really important that we find opportunities to, find, to bring communities of people along in this process. I think that there is this, you know, perhaps uh, I, I obviously we have we're, where we live in an international system, you know, we are no longer we're not isolated. Um, but I do think that we looking inwards towards, you know, national policy and thinking towards the national impact, um, especially in communities that have been devastated in the past few decades needs to be part of the discussion. Yeah, there's well, a geographic are... element to all this, if I can just add, that is really powerful. Um, one of the things that we've done is go on tours around the country with VCs and members of Congress to try to explore uh, how to get startup ecosystems going. And in almost every place, what you see or saw before COVID was just an absence of people who understood the trade craft of innovation, which is mm -hmm. a brand new thing. And I think that the single biggest government policy in that regard, and I'm tracking the Endless Frontiers Act carefully on this, is science funding. It is very hard to find any great innovative ecosystem that doesn't have a ton of government funded scientific research. And that's certainly true for the Bay Area. And it was certainly true for the Route 128 corridor. And, you know, if we want to have more places in the U.S. thriving in that way, lots more funding for lots more government science in more effective ways, not just the same old systems, right. um, is to me an essential piece of the puzzle. Right. And, and no, I think to your point, Roy, um, because I've spoken to people talking about funding of international projects. And one of the biggest issues uh, that I've heard multiple times wasn't that there wasn't enough money, but the procurement process itself uh, was quite an onerous and challenging process to the point where only firms that were very good at that process and could navigate it, you know, and it may cost 10 cents on the dollar to actually navigate it, were the ones that would get those grants. Uh, and so that we would actually have to democratize that process as well. But one question I wanted to pose to everyone, but kind of start with Roy on this, since he brought up this idea of innovation, um, was in the last presidential cycle, we heard um, now uh, candidate for uh, New York City Mayor Andrew Yang talk about this technology dividend, so to speak. Um, because, and the reason why I bring that up is because I think back to uh, we at the beginning of this call uh, said, you know, I grew up in South Haven, Michigan, which was part of the supply chain into Detroit um, for the big three. Um, but those jobs probably are not coming back, right? I mean, so. When we talk about the games- I'd happily have, stake a year's salary on the fact that they're not coming back. We'll keep going. Right. I know, exactly, right? So when we're talking about the gains that you'd see in an Apple or an Amazon uh, that obviously seem very lopsided, I mean, how do we pull people to get some of that wealth? I mean, is it just simple distribution or do you have any thoughts on, on yeah, how so we can- I strongly agree that uh, we probably need a guaranteed income. The experiment in Stockton, California, in this illustrated this powerfully to me, more people worked when they got a guaranteed income. Because if you don't have enough money to go take a little time off to go interview, real hard to get a job. Um, more people wanna pursue creativity when they have stability. And if you, you know, if you ask people who go to conferences what people want out of work, they'll all say meaning. And right. if you ask people who make less than $150,000 a year, we know because we've done the research, we've surveyed Americans on this, what they wanted to work, they say stability. More than more money, they want stability. 
because the vast majority of people do not have that. They don't know their work schedules, lots of people. They don't know how much money they're gonna make from time to time. And so um, I do think that uh, some lifting of the floor is required. Universal health care is probably more important than a guaranteed income, but you know. Um, and then as far as the tech dividend, I guess I think of tech as if everything's gonna be tech in the future, which I strongly believe it will be. I mean, we just see industry after industry transformed by technology. The three most valuable companies we've invested in are a ship, actually four, a shipping broker, a real estate title company, an insurance company, an insurance brokerage, and masterclass. So that masterclass is kind of more of a classic tech media kind of a company. Um, so if you think that, then I think the issue is not so much singling out tech, although I think tech should pay its share, but I mean, lots of money has been made on real estate from the beginning of time, kind of, and certainly in the US right now. So I don't think it's so much about redistributing tech. To James's point, not only have we not yet begun to see the productivity improvements from AI, I think we will in all likelihood. And by the way, AI is the most common technology in which we invest. We were the first venture firm to say we wanted to focus on investing in AI, but I, I don't think we're seeing it yet. And by the same token, I don't think it's tech that is the threat today to automation, although all the jobs will be automated at some point. I think it's just everything. It all fits together into a single system. Yeah, I guess. Well, unless Victoria wants to jump in first, I guess to follow on from that, I, I you know, also since we're we're all stating, I also uh, grew up in a in an industrial manufacturing town that made cars, although in the UK, not uh, not in the US. But I assume that kind of its mining genesis and uh, eventual manufacturing stuff, and then the loss of all of those jobs is very similar to Detroit in terms of uh, how things are panning out. The, there is a definite need in the US to restabilize the divide between those people who are reliant on large employment based type industries, right, for piecemeal jobs, for hourly wages, and those that are in office jobs, in management positions, and so on. And I think that there is an enormous value drop off that occurs um, within between these two groups. And it's more so in the US than pretty much anywhere else on earth. Some argue that this is because the US places so much of a premium on innovation and basically putting capital to work that those who are not the ones innovating and putting capital to work obviously lose out. I don't think that's the kind of country that we want to build. I don't think that's the kind of country that's going to get us the most entrepreneurial minds building new businesses in every sector. Um, and I just don't think it's the right thing to do ethically either, uh, but that's where we start from, right? And there has to be some shift in how we think about allocating resources across the population that allows people who are very productive from an intellectual perspective, but under tapped from an education and um, you know, demographic perspective uh, that need to be part of the engine of productivity growth in this country over the next 20, 30 years, right? And we are right now on a narrow path that we know works, right? We are able to build the Amazons and the Googles and the Facebooks. We know how that works. And our institutional venture capital um, infrastructure is great. And it grows companies that add a lot of value into the ecosystem, but we haven't yet found a template to reproduce that at the more micro level, right? To build the whole eco, the ecosystem and mosaic of smaller companies that are going to actually be the backbone of the country in, in the future, right? We don't build a backbone, economic backbone from 10 unicorns. It doesn't work that way, right? I think that's right. And I think to Roy's point of raising the floor, I think the, you know, one of the things that and along with healthcare is, you know, really thinking about wages and raising that minimum wage so that people have an opportunity to move up the social ladder. I mean, I remember stories of you had, you know, janitors, you had people coming in at Apple and working their way up. I think we, that has really disappeared uh, in the US today. And I think another part of this when we're looking about it is 
workforce development training, on the job training. I think investing in programs that help people along, that bring them along the transition, especially when we think about digital skilling, but also, you know, in blue collar jobs, the, the wealth of trades and the different skills that are available there. When you look at the US's investment as a federal government in workforce development training, it's nominal compared to the other countries that we are competing against in this AI digital future. And without, I think, support in those programs, you know, how are we going to help people in the US transition? I mean, I think the future of work is gonna look very different. You know, you're gonna have people go into multiple different careers in a lifetime. The idea that you, you know, you were one job, you're one occupation for like 50 years is gone. I think you're gonna have workers in blue collar and white collar jobs hold a number of different occupations throughout their career. And what's gonna be instrumental in that is one, having a living wage that allows you to compete. And then two, having workforce development training programs that help you get the skills so that you are qualified for the jobs that are here and that are coming. Kermit, I think you're on mute. You're still on mute. There you go. Yeah, I was like, yeah, exactly. Your facial like, expressions realize. are very, I was like, I want to hear what he's saying because he sounds happy. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I was just thinking to myself, maybe I need an AI program to let me know that I need to unmute myself. Um, but what I was going to say was uh, it's 140. And so I wanted to open up the discussion to some of the attendees for the Q&A. And it looks like our first one is coming from Marcus Courtney, who asks, uh, poses to the panel, um, how do you see the future of work and the need to decarbonize the economy to uh, stave off the worst impacts of climate change? Yeah, I mean, the, my simple way of, I posed this question at the beginning of what are the jobs that millions of people can do that can feed a family? Well, to me, the, the root of those jobs is what are the things, what's the work that needs to be done in our society? And so I think about some of the big tectonic plates. One is aging. We're clearly going to need a lot more people to work who are older. First of all, not just care for older people, which is, you know, we often tend to think of aging as about care. Those people also like want to work. You know, we're gonna have plenty of healthy, active, successful 75 year olds in future workplaces. And we just don't tend to think that way. Another is clearly addressing the impacts of climate change. And so that is a job that needs to be done. And to the extent, the, the, one, the only thing I don't know is the right mix of how much of that job need, that needs to be done needs to be offered as a public good where there's some externality and therefore the government needs to intervene in some way versus um, solved by private market forces. And you know, one of the areas I served on this commission uh, for the California governor on the future of work, and one of the areas we explored was what is the role of the military and the National Guard in this? Because let's not forget, the military is, the US military is the single largest employer in the United States and uh, Walmart's number two. And so figuring out how do we harness that infrastructure which succeeds for our country in so many ways and and devote it toward the national security threats of the president like climate change to me i'm not an expert in national security so i don't really know but that's a question that i'd pose to this community to think about because i think it's a community it's a question on which all of you can lead james that's a, yeah. uh, well there's been i guess over the last 18 months right what we've seen is that there are ways to change our particular norms with respect to work that can have an impact on areas like becoming more carbon neutral as a, as a society and have a direct impact on climate change. Obviously, they're not anywhere near sufficient for us to move the needle massively in these areas. And I think, as, as Roy points out, a lot of this is going to come from private sector innovation. When you look at things like uh, green concrete, when you look at things like uh, clothing manufacturing supply chain being revolutionized by 3D printed textiles and ways to get kind of new designs to customers and recycle clothing in, in you know, much more local uh, areas. Um, there is a lot of ideating that is happening within those communities to solve challenges that are there. And there are also these tragedies of the commons, right? These resources that we are all using these uh, things like water, water sources in, in the US um, being under threat, especially when you think about long-term conservation planning. 
uh, where the government needs to create better frameworks for how we leverage those resources, right? And what, whose responsibility it is and how we uh, make sure that uh, everybody can extract value without depleting what we're using. And those are going to need to come from these partnerships between uh, government and regulators, private actors, but it needs to be intermediated. It's not going to arise out of nothing, most likely. Uh, thank you for that question, Marcus. And I mean, I think that's essential, you know, to this conversation. Former Governor Granholm in Michigan, you know, started this conversation on clean jobs in Michigan. And I think this is totally possible and something that we need to think more about. And I agree with Rory. I mean, what is that going to look like? Is that going to be, you know, part of, is it going to be a private market solution? Is it government? I think likely probably, you know, a mix of, of both, but I, you know, I think this is possible. I think this is how, I think this is how we get there, right? I mean, this is how we start to solve this puzzle because in reality, you know, this is a huge iceberg and I think we're going to need a lot of different ideas and different solutions to start tackling tackling pieces of this and you know without including this I mean there is just no conversation so I think I'm excited to see you know what now our secretary of energy you know is looking at at this respect and that intersection into the future of work which is completely critical you know there's something that was kind of in the background of this discussion that I was hoping we had an opportunity to talk about and it looks like we will have that opportunity which is Again, kind of going back to this idea of competing forces um, in the labor market. And one of the things we haven't had a chance to broach on was the whole idea of immigration. And there are tons of people that say our immigration system is broken. It's been broken for quite some time. You know, now in the news we're talking about, or depending upon what news channel you look at, there's a crisis at the border. Um, how does our current immigration policy kind of help or hinder uh, this conversation around uh, the future of work and what we need to do and what things do you think we could change or improve to make this more of a, uh, a feeding force into improving or optimizing uh, work in the future as opposed to where it is now and I'll open that up to anyone who wants to start. So I, I'm the daughter of immigrants. My mom immigrated here from Ecuador and my father came here from Thailand. And I grew up in an immigrant community, you know, here in the U.S. And I think, and then I went out to California and, and spent some time out there. I mean, I don't think our immigration system supports, um, our current immigration system supports innovation, supports uh, labor. I think I saw firsthand what happened when you had, you know, dearths of Stanford graduates that were eager and excited to participate in Americans' innovation community, not being able to because of immigration policy. And where did they go? They ended up going to Canada, they ended up going to Europe. And that I think um, that that just, you know, having being educated in the US and wanting to contribute, but not being able to losing that creative energy, detrimental. And I think, you know, unfortunately, I, you know, the immigration discussion is, is very heated. And I think us as being involved in the innovation sector, there is, I think, a, we are competing with China. I mean, everyone knows it. I mean, I think that it's, it, this is plain, this is clear. And I think unless we really start to rethink immigration, especially providing opportunities for people to participate in our economy today, we are going to lose out. Well, I think we're already starting to see that happen in the, you know, in the past decade. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with that. Oh, sorry, James, go ahead. No, no, Roy, please. I just think U.S. immigration policy is incredible government public policy for Canada and to some extent for China. It is the greatest unforced error. I mean, the number of times I cannot, we invested in a fund whose only purpose is to help founders stay in the country when they need to stay on a visa. I have spent oh. inordinate numbers of hours learning the difference between O1s and H1Bs and all these things. And I'm the son of immigrants, you know, and I don't know if my parents would have been able to come to the United States under current policy, but, uh, and I realize that we have enormous issues around, um, you know, I, I'll use a different word than high skill and low skill, just because a person who, uh, organized restaurant workers said, you know what, take any AI PhD and ask them to wait tables for a night and then tell me it's a low skill job. And so they said it's high wage versus low wage, which is now of what I have now adopted as a result. Nice. Um, uh, and 
you know, we need the scientists, we need the doers, we need the crazies, you know, we need all those people in the country and we're pushing them all away. And, you know, it, we have no one even to blame but ourselves. Uh, and so I, it's just a long-winded way of saying I agree. Yeah, and I, I, I couldn't feel more strongly in the same way. I was an anchor baby um, that was only allowed to stay in the country for two weeks in Florida before we were sent back to, uh, to Europe. Um, and then later came back uh, in any case. But we need to flip things around completely. We need to think about immigration as finding really good reasons to not let people into the country to work and add value to our economy, right? It should not be finding really good reasons and inordinate numbers of loopholes and playing stupid games with various government departments to get super qualified people to come in and help us to create more tax revenue. That should not be the game that companies are playing when it comes to finding the best human capital resources to push their strategies forward. Uh, but that is literally what happens, right? It happens at all the biggest companies in the US to get the top people to come in, it's a struggle. Um, and it shouldn't be, it should just flip it around completely. Um, I think there are very few scientific uh, experiments that show anything but huge gains from having uh, fairly fluid immigration into countries. You know, in the minutes, the few minutes that we have left, I wanted to close with one last question um, and try to keep it as broad as possible um, and then just give everyone an opportunity to answer. So there are different scenarios that could obviously happen uh, with the future of work. And I'm trying to play a little look into your crystal ball type of game here. But what do you think are the, the worst and best case scenarios of how we can improve um, you know, or even worsen, so to speak, the, the, the work situation in the United States over the next 25 years. Um, I mean, just to look at the bookends of that and how we avoid the worst and get to the best. Can, can you ask opinion. the question again? What do you, what do you, I mean, I feel like we've been talking about all these different methods for doing that. So I just want to try to make sure I understand the, the core of the question. Sure, of course. So the core of the question is this. Um, I mean, if you look at doomsday scenarios of the way that work could potentially go in the United States, most things are automated. A lot of people lose their jobs. Things like transfer, transportation uh, no longer happens when done by humans. Some people would argue this is a, a worst case scenario because it would create a lot of unemployment. So what is the, in your opinion, the way that we can get it wrong and the way that we can get it right in terms of using technology to- Got it. I, I, so I have a slightly different kind of take on that. Please. Um, and my take on that is we're in it now. Look at the opioids crisis. Look at how many people are struggling to make ends meet and report financial insecurity. I'm sure people have seen the data about the vast majority of Americans being unable to afford $400 for an unexpected expense. Right. Let's not sit here and say, we're okay now. Could get better, could get worse. Let's say, let's make it way better from where it is right now because we have, in my opinion, you know, a great nation that is at risk of becoming ungreat if we even allow the status quo to continue. And we have a lot of energy that suggests that literally people, you know, protesting in the streets and attacking the Capitol. And so like, I don't think to me, the future of work being now means let's not wait for a doomsday. Let's act based on this as we see it right now. James, are you gonna go? No, no, please, I, I was waiting for you. <laughs> You know, I think that we've touched on a lot of elements that can either create a doomsday or a place where we all succeed. And I think it's evident to me that we need, you know, number one, we need to raise the floor. We need wages to keep up with productivity. We need to give people an opportunity to participate in the economy. You know, I think that our immigration, that we need to reform that. Like we need to create more opportunities for people who are coming, who wanna stay, who wanna contribute, that they're able to do that. And I, I just don't see, you know, this conversation without healthcare. If the pandemic has taught us anything, I mean, it's taught us that this matters and making sure that people, you know, are protected and are healthy and are able to do their jobs is fundamental. So, you know, I think that if we are truly going to gain in the strides, if we are going to continue being a leader in this, I think without addressing these like fundamental 
issues, we're just not going to be able to get there, even if we have the brightest innovations and the brightest things, because it takes a whole community of people. I mean, it's not, we're not isolated. You know, it's, you, we have to think about, I think, the collective in order to allow our, you know, individual superstar innovators to be able to go and get after it. Yeah, I guess, as, you know, as the AI PhD who has weighted tables in, in the group, I, you know. There you go. Like, you could tell us for sure. And, and been a coworker I, at Bloomberg. You, you have all the perspectives. I, I, I can tell you for sure which one is harder. Yeah. It, and, uh, and it's not doing the AI side. Um, but I, I think that we've got, there are two tensions to this, right? One is that we want to make sure that the companies that are in the US creating jobs in the US, creating value for the US economy stay in the US, right? And we need to build an environment that is open to them being able to have the impact that they're going to have on, on our economy. So it's there is an aspect to this, which is building up so that we have the capacity from a human perspective, right? So that our human capital and human values are in the right place to maximize what we get and what each person gets out of society. And on the other side, it's making sure that we have the institutional structures in place that allow companies to grow and be successful and take advantage of that human capital. And we shouldn't forget one or, and beget, or beget the other, right, when we're considering these. And I think, you know, in terms of automation and AI and the impact it's going to have on jobs, yes, artificial intelligence will change a lot of the tasks that get performed within the companies of today and the companies of tomorrow. We will automate a lot of jobs. And if you, we've done surveys of the US population and international, and we see that people are very worried about what impact that will have on their livelihood, on their ability to live. Um, but the reality of it, what we're seeing in, in the data on kind of the labor markets over the last 10, 15 years, is that where there is more AI innovation and more automation of jobs, there is also more creation of jobs and more creation of new tasks that are going to allow people to be potentially even happier in the jobs that they're doing, give them more flexibility, more freedom, and grow our economy. So I think you know these all all these different pieces hold hands together in the end. It's not that we're going to see one part, whether it be technology or something else, destroy the others. I think we have a huge opportunity to create synergistic value across these. And with that, we'll close. Uh, Vicky, Roy, James, thank you so much for making such a great panel, sharing your insights on AI, the future of work where we are now uh, and what we need to improve to get it right. Roy, you raised your hand. Did you want to say waving something? waving to say thank you. <laughs> no, that wasn't, I have nothing left to say. Victoria and James um, have said so many wonderful things and it's great to learn from the other panelists too. So thank you, Kermit, for bringing us together. Yes, yep. thank you. Likewise, this was very informative for me. Thank you very much. I learned a, a great deal as well. So take care. We'll. Uh,